Boa noite a todas e todos. Saudações especiais aos nossos anfitriões portugueses, aos brasileiros e aos af africanos lusófonos presentes. Eu me chamo Adele, sou brasileira, e essa é a minha primeira visita ao país dos meus colonizadores. My name is Adele Godoy Vrana. I am Brazilian. And this is my first visit to my colonizer's country. And my name is Seiko Bauters. I'm American, and although most of my ancestors come from Europe, I haven't been to Portugal since I was a little girl. Tonight, we are going to take you on a journey through our own colonizer and colonized pasts, and talk about how this still impacts all our lives today, including online, including the knowledge commons. And we have to warn you, it could get a little heavy, because talking about this stuff isn't easy, but we really hope you'll come with us on this journey and let's just see where we all end up together. And this particular journey is begins with our fathers. My father died eight months ago. On a Wednesday in September, he called me in the United States and he asked me to jump on an emergency flight to accompany his transition from life to death. So I traveled. 5,000 miles to the Netherlands, over 24 hours. And we sat down to breakfast the next day, and he told me he'd like to die on a Tuesday. He was lucky enough to have time to put his affairs in order, to be living in a country like the Netherlands with really good health care and end-of-life options, and to die in his bed in a small village surrounded by a doctor, a nurse, his fourth wife, and one of his five children, me. I used to say he was the ancestor that I was the least proud of, and like many others in his life, I would sometimes go a really long time without speaking to him. But as he became sick with cancer over this past year, we grew a lot closer, and I began to recognize that, as always, His story and his self were much more complex than I ever gave him credit for. This September will be four years since my dad passed away. He died alone of a heart attack at his home in Brazil. My daddy's body sat in abandonment for days before the foul smell of alerted the nearby neighbors. Both my mother and my younger brother were out of the country, and I was living 6,000 miles away in California. There was no time to fly back to our hometown and say goodbye. We were not there for him, but his mother, three of his sisters, and one brother, all of whom he barely talked to, showed up to bury him. My dad was a depressive alcoholic who mostly avoided any relationship with his parents and siblings. Growing up in Brazil, I saw my grandparents maybe three times my whole life. My dad barely talked about them or with them. He always struggled because he didn't know why his parents didn't love him or treat him as well they treated their siblings. There was this big why lurking around my dad's existence. And this made my dad a seeker. The problem is he was looking in the wrong place. He assumed He was the problem and he was guilty. That's when he used the alcohol, the gambling, the self-sabotage and unhealthy life choices to numb his deepest pains. My father was an alcoholic with a lifelong disease. And this stubborn anger inherited from generations of Bautresses who never really accepted the fact that willpower alone would not change things. He was always on the move. He was always seeking somewhere else where things would be different. And he shifted his life and our family across continents whenever his luck ran out or relationships wore thin in one place. When I was small, he took me away from the rest of my family. He and my four-year-old self hitchhiked together across the United States. Over time, I grew up with our family spread across three continents the Netherlands, the United States, and yes, even Brazil. And this sense of dislocation began to feel normal. 
My father was unpredictable, and he would suddenly fly into these bouts of rage or sadness with no explanation, and it terrified my childhood self. He could be petty, suddenly upset over really small things. He could be unkind or dishonest to the women in his life. He conflated illness with weakness. As a child, I learned so many of his habits and I just took them as normal, learning to deal with them as best I could. As a young woman, I rejected them and I started to put up walls to protect myself from him and anyone like him. My dad was severely abused, both physically and mentally, by my grandfather. He would often tell me about his most painful childhood memory. My grandfather hung him naked in a tree for hours to punish him for eating something he wasn't supposed to. He was just a little boy. My grandfather was a white man. I know absolutely nothing about his ancestors, but I do know that their whiteness has always been hypervalued, both inside and outside my dad's family. Despite this, he married a woman who was not white. True, she might have considered herself as such. I may never told, I have never told my father, but I have a theory that he was rejected and mistreated by his father because he didn't have the right color. Most of my dad's siblings had light skin, light colored eyes, straight hair. They all looked white or could pass as white with the exception of my dad. He was brown, had curly hair, brown eyes. In my theory, my dad's body and existence reminded my grandfather of his tainted whiteness. Being black, or at least looking like a black man, automatically made him less worthy of love and respect than his siblings. Systemic racism was the answer to the big why my dad was seeking for his whole life. I too have a theory. I think my father carried with him the ghosts of his ancestors, including a lot of violence and anger passed down through generations. I have this photo of my dad. He was about six, and he's wearing this big knee bandage. When I asked him about it once, he told me it was because my grandmother threw a plate at him for making some kind of mischief. And my great-grandfather, too, was known for his temper and violent behavior. I think my father must have come from a really long line of working-class folks, white folks, who never quite knew what to do with all those ugly feelings and experiences they had bottled up inside them. Ironically, and yet quite fitting, my father didn't consider himself a black man. We never discussed race with me, or my younger brother. We never had the talk that black parents give their children about how to act when we are stopped by the police based on racial profiling. We never heard about Zumbi, Mandela, or black icons in Brazil or the world's history. We were not introduced to black artists and taught how to admire black culture with my dad. We never talked about our ancestors and what was done to them because of slavery. We were Afro-descendants raised in a racial vacuum. The Dutch side of my family is the one I've learned the least about. And this was definitely something I avoided because of both my troubled relationship with my father, but also because of the ugly history of European colonization that so many of us would much rather forget. So what do I really know? about the ancestors of this ancestor that I've been the least proud of. In our last months together, my father and I talked a lot about our family and about colonization. I had just been to South Africa and was thinking a good deal about the Netherlands' role in the oppression of African people there. My father was quite sure that the Bouterses were involved in the Dutch slave trade and he confessed to not being able to enter the nearby shipbuilders museum because it made him feel ashamed and disgusted. After my father's death, 
I began to revisit the history of the transatlantic slave trade, this time trying to locate myself in it. The Dutch golden age of exploration was often portrayed, right? It's often known as this time of abundant commerce, of capital, of art, of science, and okay, sure, it was those things. But this capitalist quest was built on a foundation of slavery. Like my father, Dutch slave traders covered a lot of ground on this planet. For almost 300 years, until the 1870s, the Dutch sailed across the Atlantic with enslaved black people from the west coast of Africa. The first of them to arrive in North America, where I live today, came on a Dutch ship. But initially, the Dutch shipped African people to northern Brazil. It's devastating to think that two women I know and love so well, you, Adeli, as well as my youngest sister, who is also Afro-Brazilian, are quite possibly the descendants of those enslaved people. And I am quite possibly the descendants of their traitors. What were their lives and stories? As the descendant of the free African people who were once enslaved, I don't know my ancestors' wives or stories. I know there's a chance that my ancestors could have been brought to Brazil on a Dutch ship. Right, because the Dutch ripped over half a million African people from their homes. Yeah, but most likely they were captured and brought to America by the Portuguese. The Portuguese who sailed to Africa from right here in Lisbon were responsible for over 40% of the transatlantic slave trade. They shipped over 4 million Africans to their colonies, including Brazil. And Brazil was also the last country in the world to abolish slavery in 1888. I feel the pain of being the descendant of the Africans who were brought as slaves to Brazil, either by your Dutch ancestors or the Portuguese. But just as strongly, I feel the invitation to think about my own ancestors and the effects of colonization from a seeker's perspective. And so, we've embarked on this journey of exploring our ancestors together, of braiding our stories of the past together in order to understand how colonization and racism shapes our collective lives today. Yeah. Growing up in the California public school system, I had generally understood history to be the stories of dead white men who I felt little to no connection with. As a white settler, Living on Native American land, I definitely knew enough to understand that a lot of people had been killed and had things stolen from them so that white families, just like mine, could have a new home. And I knew I wasn't being told the whole truth at school. I wasn't taught, for example, that many descendants of those Native people are still alive today. I didn't know that there is a 600-member tribal band, the Amamutsun, who are still fighting for federal recognition and land rights precisely where I live. I couldn't really locate myself in all those old kings and governors, soldiers and battles. I wasn't taught how to place women and girls like you and me in those stories. I felt the gaps in the silences. And again, I had this overwhelming sense of dislocation. So I just tuned out. Yeah, growing up as an Afro-Brazilian, the idea of looking back to my ancestors sounded unattainable. I didn't have the financial resources, the time, or emotional support to do it. On top of that, I felt extremely overwhelmed because I didn't know where to even begin looking. As part of me, I wanted to know more, but mainly I resented and felt discouraged by the kind of information that was being presented to me. At school, History was my beloved and at the same time most hated topic. I loved to learn about the past, but hated the classes that would touch on colonization and slavery. I remember slouching down my chair every time we got to the chapters of Columbus and the discovery of America. Or when I saw the pictures of Africans being shipped to my country. 
my white classmates felt affirmed and to read the discoveries and achievements of their ancestors, while I felt in fear seeing my ancestors being portrayed as lifeless bodies, property with no name, agency, or knowledge. Their stories made me shrink, shut up, and feel less than. In this colonizer ancestry that I'm still learning to trace on my dad's side, I have a sense that there's a lot of information out there and I'll just need to sift through it. I've heard that my Dutch grandmother did a genealogy project a while back that traced her side of the family all the way back to the 16th century. And Adeli, these are not barons or kings, these are peat diggers and other working class folks. For ordinary white people in the Netherlands, it seems that tracing back 400 years is not an impossible task. But it's no accident, Adeli, that your family records are a lot harder to trace than mine. Yeah, sequel, because the colonizers, colonizers intentionally destroy slave records, including documents and information about the free women and men they capture in the African continent. Colonizers wiped out indigenous and African knowledge, names, tribes, family connections, and culture in order to conquer them. They knew that not having a past, not knowing your own origins, would make it almost impossible for us to affirm and liberate ourselves. This lack of records also made it easier to sell the story of my Brazil being a racial democracy, where everyone is equal, no matter their race. Well, sorry to burst any bubbles here, but that's a myth. Brazil is not a racial democracy. Yeah, and the United States is not a colorblind country either. We're still debating whether black lives matter. My own grandparents were part of the generation that believe in whitening the Brazilian population by actively encouraging mixed race relationships between white, black, and indigenous people. Brazil's post-slavery strategy to reduce the number of Afro-Brazilians was basically to promote immigrants who looked like me. Yeah, the idea was that having more white people live in Brazil and engage in interracial relationships would then gradually whiten the overall population. As this was coming out of a long history of colonization in which, sure, some interracial inter relationships were consensual, but most of them were not. It seems like your grandparents' relationship is a really clear example of Brazil's whitening ideology. Right. And my black father represented the failure of this whitening process. So in return, his white father made his life miserable. Would my father's childhood and later life have been any different if he saw and affirmed himself as a black man? What would have happened to me if my history books portrayed my African ancestors as being human beings with rights, culture, and stories instead of as property and disposable labor? Knowing is a choice. And there's a cost. We as individuals, communities, and society pay when we choose not to know. For my dad, my family, and myself, whose ancestors were colonized, not knowing can be destructive or even fatal. And for my dad, my family, and myself, whose ancestors were colonizers, not knowing or talking about it eats away at our hearts. It erodes our sense of connectedness and trust, and it leads to some really ugly ways of using our power and privilege to oppress others in our world today. I'm still working up my courage to go to the museum that my father didn't want to visit and to locate my ancestors in the fabric of the slave trade. And this too is a marker of my privilege because I have the ability to decide if I want to face this history or not. For a long time, it was easier not to know. But what I've also learned, especially as the child of an alcoholic, is that silence has a long-term cost. Living disconnected with violence and mistrust was bad for me, and it's bad for everyone. Yeah, and even when some of us try to fool ourselves and avoid knowing our past, this racist world we live in will remind us 
My father may have believed that he could simply avoid racism by choosing to not identify himself as a black man. The problem is, this is not an option. I am black, and the world will treat me as such. As a child, I experienced racism, physical abuse, violence, and depression, and I didn't know why. As an adult, I often still feel invisible and oppressed in many spaces, including in our own open knowledge commons. And simply not talking about identity and race in our movement doesn't make the problem go away. In reality, unknowing feeds racism. And racism is just not bad for me, it's bad for everyone. And we can't address racism in our communities if we think of it as only your problem and not mine too. Examining ourselves, our ancestors and our communities today is really painful, but it's also a really important part of the healing process. We have to unearth it and learn to tell stories that contain multiple truths and perspectives. So at this point in our story, depending who you are, and we know who you are, white people, <laughs> you might be feeling a little uncomfortable or guilty or maybe just want to distance yourself from your own ancestors. Yeah, you might be thinking that all this has nothing to do with you, with all of us here in this room today. And finally, you might think, be thinking, gosh, that Seiko is such a hero for talking about her slave trading ancestors and poor Adeli is just an endless victim in this narrative. Yeah, or you might be thinking that Seiko is a monster, and I am the hero of this story. But in this story, there are neither heroes, nor victims, nor monsters. We contain all these things, and everything in between. It's a trap to thinking binaries. Being the oppressor, or the oppressed, depends on context. It depends on where you are, and who you're talking to. You've already heard the bad about our fathers, but we also want to share some of the good with you. I loved my father. Although he terrified me, he could also be generous and super lively. He was a musician who could make a room come alive with his guitar. He had an easy directness and a wicked sense of humor, which was really fun to be around. He had a background in biology, and through him, I learned to look closely at the natural world around me, to forage in the woods, and to love nature and the outdoors in all of its glorious big and small moments. And because he brought a translator's mind to the culture and political economy of each place he lived, from him I learned early on that ours was both a deeply connected and a deeply fragmented world. Other than his children, and a bunch of memories, not much was left behind from my dad's life. But he did leave me with a letter in which he offered me this wish. May your path be wondrous and have an impact on this difficult world. I also loved my father. His life was not filled with huge memorable achievements. He didn't leave many things behind, but still, he has a legacy. He taught me that acknowledging and accepting feelings is as hard as it is rewarding. My dad showed me that vulnerability is a superpower and not a weakness. I learned how to say I'm sorry from him. He was also the first man I saw crying without shame. It was probably my first feminist learning. Men can cry too, and that's okay. And now, when I have dance parties with my children, I remember that my father, too, filled our home with music. It would have been really easy to select just one side of our fathers and to focus on it to tell their stories. Instead, we choose to acknowledge that they contain multitudes, as we all do. Having a better understanding of the multitudes that my father and my ancestors contained is helping me recognize which parts I choose to cultivate and seek to pass on to my own child and to the next generation, and which parts I actively seek to let die with him. So let's keep the sense of humor, the love of nature perhaps, but let's let go of the rage and the violence.
What kind of ancestor do I want to be? Today I see that becoming a seeker is my way of claiming my dad's legacy. My dad sought the answer he could, that could have changed his life, but he died without knowing it. I wish he could see me telling his story. My dad always said that he was proud of me for who I was and what I had become. I wonder what he would feel knowing that he now can rest as I become, become the seeker for him, my children, and anyone whose ancestors were silenced and violated by colonization. Knowing our past, our ancestors, and being able to affirm and liberate oneself should not be unattainable or a privilege. Acknowledging the ugly things in our past that we don't choose to continue, as well as the good that we do want to carry forward, is helping us figure out what kind of a present and a future we want to create together. This helps us become whole people, better allies, and build just and equitable communities. And it's both a gift and a responsibility. Yeah, now you fast track years, many long journeys, and here we are. That little Afro-Brazilian girl became an anti-racist activist, an against all odds Wikimedian, kind of a techie, a mother raising two feminist boys, and an accidental US resident. And that dislocated little girl that I was eventually discovered the internet as a way to connect and build community with people across our many different realities, no matter where I was living. I became an online free knowledge activist, a Wikipedian, a co-conspirator, and the mother of a kick-ass feminist daughter. Today we are both co-directors of the nonprofit called Whose Knowledge, building an internet where all of our stories and knowledges can be visible and represented online. And we work in solidarity with marginalized communities around the world, including women, black and brown people, LGBTQIA folks, indigenous peoples, and folks from the global south. We are making sure that black women like me can see and be themselves online. And despite all of these differences in our paths, one thing we share is a commitment to call out and to fill these urgent silences and gaps in the knowledge commons, including in spaces like Wikipedia or in digital archives. Our compañera, and whose knowledge co-director, Anasuya Sengupta, talks about these gaps as the hidden crisis of unknowing. When we do not know each other as fully and as deeply as we should, this perpetuates even more violence and injustice in our world. Now, you might be wondering what on earth any of this has to do with Creative Commons. Well, if we're going to share knowledge and creativity together online in ways that will be actually useful for the future, we can't keep repeating the same old colonizers' mistakes. So many of our stories are still missing not just our own lives or school books, but also on the internet that we are creating and curating together. Over half of the world is online today, finally. And three quarters of these digital folks are from the global south. Nearly half of the world's women are also online. We know that our kids will learn about the world by searching the internet. Whose knowledge will they find there? The internet's knowledge today doesn't yet reflect the rich diversity of the world. Let's take Wikipedia, the fifth most visited website in the world as a proxy for the internet's knowledge. Most of the people who write Wikipedia are still white men from North America and Europe. Only one in 10 of Wikipedia's editors are women, and even fewer are trans or non-binary. And because who you are has an impact on what you create, Wikipedia's content also reflects these gaps. Every episode of The Simpsons has a Wikipedia article, for example. Military history, also pretty good. Coverage of female porn stars, also decent. Yeah, but we're still missing tons of biographies of Brazilian women scientists or activists. And it's not just Wikipedia that has this problem. Many of the conversations in the Commons about open access research or free and open licensing so far have been driven by people who don't look like us. 
Or they've been driven by people who look more like me and less like me. So what happens when we stop considering open to be a set of legal, legal conditions defined by folks in the global north? And instead, if we begin to consider this whole range of open practices that make sense in different contexts around the world. Hey, for just a minute, let's try on somebody else's shoes. Yeah, let's do that. So put yourselves in the shoes of an accomplished Brazilian woman who has been asked to share her image under a CC by SA license on Wikipedia. Someone might try to assure you that having your picture on Wikipedia illustrating your own biography is good for the knowledge commons. But oh, by the way, the licensing also means that your image can be used to sell breakfast cereal without your consent or, or again. Does that feel good to you? After colonization and slavery, can you trust that the Knowledge Commons will respect you, your image, and history? Will they ask for your consent? Will they consider changing their open policies to protect and center you? Or are you the only one who has to change? Or let's try on the shoes of a member of the Kumeyaay Nation. That's an indigenous community whose lands stretch across what's also known as going from Southern California to Northern Baja, Mexico. You see knowledge as something collectively stewarded by members of your tribe, as something that's passed down from elders to the next generation, as something to be protected and sometimes shared only in certain contexts. And through colonization, you've seen just how many of the things you protect and share are stolen from you by the colonizers, time and time again. Do you think you'd trust the open movement to do something different with your knowledge this time around? Does the idea of public domain, which makes some knowledge suddenly available to everyone everywhere on this planet on a random date make any sense to you and your community at all? Creative Commons is a really important part of the open knowledge movement. And in this open movement, even our best aspirational frameworks still contain a whole lot of colonizers' assumptions that are based in unknowing. And in order to not recreate the oppression of the past, we need to understand it better. We need to make the choice to know and to confront colonization and racism, despite our own discomfort or pain. And we're going to make mistakes along the way. I mean, you and I do that all the time, but it shouldn't stop us. And only then, with this foundation of mutual respect and shared understanding, can we begin to reimagine and co-create an open knowledge commons that truly represents us all. Adeli and I really wish we could give you the five easy steps for decolonizing the internet and the commons. I mean, wouldn't that be nice? Yes. <laughs> yeah. But... Here's the thing, colonization was a process that was built over hundreds of years, and it's going to take more than a few easy steps to undo it. And as we go into the rest of this conference, instead of simple instructions, what we invite you to do is ask yourself some of the questions we have been asking ourselves on this journey. How have I benefited from colonization, racism, or simply just maintaining the status quo. What from my own past do I choose to carry forward? And what should I let die? Whose knowledge is still missing? And what can I do to support and honor the people who can best fill those gaps and silences? What kind of ancestor do I want to be? Thank, Thank you. you.